Hello, my name is Evan Bullion. I'm a senior research software engineer in the Capraso lab, and we're going to get started on the Alpha Diversity tutorial. So first thing I'm going to do is go to Downstream Tutorial and select Alpha Diversity Visualizations. So one of the first steps we might be interested in is trying to see if there's any general patterns. We might do this with just richness. And so that's called in Chime 2 Observed Features. And we're going to use the Chime 2 Diversity Alpha Group Significance tool. So going over to Galaxy, I'm going to go to Chime 2 Diversity Alpha Group Significance. Clicking on that, we're going to go back to our instructions. And it says set alpha diversity to the observed features vector of core metrics phylogenetic. And for metadata, we're going to set it to just our sample metadata. And then we'll press execute. So that's pretty straightforward. So over here we see that it has auto-populated something, but it's not really what we want. It's the evenness vector. What we actually want is the observed features vector. Your numbers will be different. I've just bootstrapped this history so that we can make this tutorial work. Um, and then we set our sample metadata, which is what we have, and we're done. So we're going to hit execute. So we can see the report, two inputs, produces this output. We're going to wait for that to generate. And that'll take just a moment. I'm going to go back to the instructions while that's running. So we set our alpha diversity to observe features and our metadata to just our sample metadata. Then we execute it. And it's going to recommend we rename this to alpha group sig observed features. So I'm going to copy that and we see this is finished. I'm going to press this edit button to rename it. I'm going to call it Alpha Group Sig Observed Features. There we go. So that's a little bit easier. So let's have a look. So to do that, we're going to click on the View at Chime 2 View button right here. And we see some box plots. So the first is Patient ID. And so these are the patients um, of this study. And we see that observed features or richness is actually really pretty different between them. Um, looking at the p-value, like that is unbelievably significant, which is not surprising because these are different individuals and they all have different microbiomes. Now, something important is because these are individuals and they were sampled repeatedly, we're violating assumptions about independence. And so this initial kruskal wallace test is valid because we are comparing uh, different groups. But as soon as we look across patient IDs, it becomes a little more nebulous. So maybe we look at consistency. And so we have formed stools, liquid stools, and semi-formed stools. Let me zoom in a little bit. Now the picture is still small. Um, and kruskal wallace reports, in fact, there is a significant result here. But keep in mind, we have violated independence because we are looking at um, the same patients, which are going to be correlated with each other, with themselves, essentially. And so observations from multiple observations from the same patient mean that our total observations are not independent of each other. Um, nonetheless, we do kind of expect this. And so even though this isn't, you know, the most ironclad p-value in the world, it still makes sense, and there's really no reason for us to expect anything different. Um, we might also be interested in perhaps disease. Looking at that, we see um, not significant differences. We can also look at uh, multiple comparisons. In that case, you would be interested in the q-value because we are generating hypotheses here. We are not validating any, and so we don't have any a priori expectation that this model makes any sense or that this is the statistical test that we're interested in. So we need to use this corrected p-value, which is clearly not very significant. Another thing we might be interested in is, did the group, so the group that received autofecal microbiota transplant, um, are those significantly different from the group that didn't, or control? And so we might look at auto-FMT group. 
And so the original pa uh, paper reports that there was a difference here, but that's not seen in this case because we do not have a significant result ignoring our violation of independence right now. And these box plots, you know, they really aren't a compellingly different, right? Our means are dead center and maybe they skew in one direction where the control is, it, it actually skews the opposite direction you would expect where the control maybe has higher diversity and the treatment maybe has less. But this is largely because we are not controlling for individuals and we're kind of coming at this in a crude way. So to do something more uh, sophisticated, we're going to need a linear mixed effect model. And so what a linear mixed effect model does is essentially it takes a, it assumes that you can have a random intercept or a random slope or both. And what that means is that we're going to choose a group, in this case patient ID, which we say they all have um, a related impact on the alpha diversity. And so each of our samples represents a random draw from that individual's bucket of probable richness. From there, we separate that out from the effect of any particular group that we're interested in. And so it's basically declaring some individual or population of samples share some common behavior, which we can't explain. It's random to us, um, but it is related. And so that's a way of capturing this correlated or dependent behavior while still trying to understand how different um, categories might be important. So we're gonna try this out and then we'll walk through kind of what the model's really saying. So we're going to use trying to longitudinal linear mixed effects. Going back over here, we go to chain two, longitudinal, and we find linear mixed effects. So the instructions are to move that. We are going to use our sample metadata. We're going to insert another metadata, and this is going to actually be a metadata from an artifact. And so this is one of the nice things that Chime 2 can do is sometimes our artifacts are really also metadata and sometimes your metadata is data. Like there's not actually a strong distinction between these. And so we're going to combine basically the richness for each sample with the metadata for each sample because they're kind of the same structure ultimately. So let's start there. So we're going to insert metadata we're going to select metadata, not from TSV, but from artifact. And so here it's guessing that maybe we're talking about Bray Curtis PQA results. Actually, there's kind of all of our artifacts in here. So what I'm going to do is actually search. So I'm going to search for observed features. There we go. So now we have the right artifact and I'll go back to the instructions. So we set up our metadata Next, we're going to set our state column to day relative to nearest HSC, HCT, sorry. So I'm going to copy this. And so the way I did that is I just double clicked on it, copy, and our state column is this. Next is our individual ID column, which is gonna be our patient ID. So these are all the individuals in the study. And these individuals are going to receive a random intercept. So the model is going to assume that each patient has its own baseline diversity. And for reasons we don't understand, samples of that patient are going to wander around randomly from that baseline. Oops. Next, we're going to set our metric to observed features. And so that will involve expanding additional options. So we're going to expand additional options, metric, we're going to provide a value which is observed features. Perfect. All right. Is there anything else we have to do? No, we get to press the execute button. So we cannot worry about the rest of this. And we're going to execute. So this will take a few minutes. So let's talk a little bit more about linear mixed effects. So 
What this really is, is a combination of fixed effects. So this looks like a normal linear regression, where you have some coefficient that you think is related to x. And the goal is to find the values for that coefficient such that that coefficient times x mostly matches what you observe. So that's a really simple kind of model. With a random effect, we add some random per group coefficient. Now, in estimating this coefficient, we will have a value, but it's not important or even interesting because what we've done is we've estimated some coefficient times x that we already know the coefficient is derived from some random distribution. And so the, to the degree that we are interested in it, it's, it doesn't matter because it's random. So how do you ascribe any kind of association to what we already didn't know? There's no model that you can make with a random coefficient beyond this is unknown source of variability. I apologize if that's a little bit confusing. Okay. So the linear mixed effect is a combination of fixed effects and random effects. These fixed effects are exactly what you'd expect in a typical linear regression. So these are your betas times your x creates your y. Um, and so usually when we have a fixed effect, we assume that there is some population parameter which is helping to define this distribution. With a random effect, what we're saying is there is some per group variance that not only can we not explain, we have no intention of explaining. And so these random points or random draws for each uh, sample in our model are essentially going to be derived from a per group distribution. Um, and so that will allow us to more clearly identify the fixed effects because the random effects are going to basically pull out the variance that we would have otherwise had to deal with because every individual here has their own personal microbiome. So it's kind of like attempting to subtract out the personalized microbiome. Um, interestingly, the model is going to estimate coefficients for these random effects, but those coefficients aren't interesting to us because what they represent is some association to some completely unknown cause that we're just calling random. And so there's really no interpretation of, you know, the beta of a random effect because it's random. We already don't know what it means. And so adding a number to don't know doesn't really give you more information. What can be useful is knowing the variance within that group to try and understand to what extent uh, the random effect is working, and we'll see that in our model here. So going back, this has finished. So I'm going to expand this. Um, the tutorial indicates I should rename it to LME Observed Features, HCT, which sounds good to me. Let me make sure I'm in the right spot. Yeah, that's the right one. So I'm going to click the Edit button. I'm going to rename it and save. Okay, so let's have a look at this. So I'm going to click View at Chime 2 View. And so we see first a lot of tables and then also some diagnostic plots. So let's start with our table. At the start, we have our fixed effects formula. So this is describing kind of a normal linear model. So we're saying, can we explain observed features, our richness, on the basis of days relative to nearest HCT? Our metric here is observed features. We could have inferred that from the formula. We're not grouping, but we do have a state and an individual column. And so our state column is our day. And so that's our fixed effect. That's kind of what we'd expect. So is there an association between the time since the bone marrow transplant procedure and richness? And we are going to create a random intercept for each patient ID. And so that will attempt to pull out the uh, personal microbiome and, you know, kind of what we saw over, I'm going to switch tabs here, over here when we looked at patient ID. So we see everyone's very different, right? And so the random effect is basically saying, hey, I'm going to understand our model as I'm taking some intercept, which is probably going to look a lot like this. And then I'm going to parameterize the samples as being random draws from kind of this box plot. 
So then after we do that, what is left? And that's what our fixed effects are going to try and identify. Um, you'll notice this says random effects none. That isn't actually true. Uh, if you read the help text for this tool, um, individual ID columns are automatically added as random intercepts. Um, so this random effects would be if you wanted random slopes, for instance, or more random intercepts. Our model summary, um, a lot of this isn't too interesting. We have 356 samples, 24 groups, so that's 24 patients. The smallest group had only two samples per patient. One patient had 34 samples. On average, they had 14 samples each. Um, we see our scale parameter or variance. We see log likelihood. Um, and we see it didn't necessarily converge, but that's not too surprising. If we look at our model results, this is going to tell us about our actual coefficients. So we have an intercept, which has a coefficient um, reported in its natural units. So this would be richness. Um, so the average richness is generally 85. If we look at our scatter plot, you know, that seems sensible. We're saying on average for the whole data set, we start at about 85. Day relative to nearest HCT is some multiplication of that. And so we're saying we're going to subtract basically as each day happens, we're going to drop half of a unit of richness. Um, which is about what we see here, right? So if we start at day zero and we go 10 days, it looks like we dropped, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's about five. It's hard to say, um, but that's what this coefficient is representing. And then we have our within group variance of 290. Um, I don't have very much to say about that, to be honest. Um, but if you, for instance, saw a scale parameter or the group variance of, you know, something truly unreasonable, you might want to have a think about whether or not your random intercepts or random slopes are really doing what you think they are. In this case, 290 compared to our overall scale of 1700, I'm not at all worried about it, but I don't have a good way to quantify, you know, the gut feeling of whether that was useful or not. Over here, we see the regression scatter plot. So we've got our general slope. Um, we also have the projected residuals. And so the residuals are important because if there are systematic biases or uh, situations where you can like visually recognize a pattern, it's usually an indication of either model misfit or something deeper is quite wrong. So if we look at this, we see that we have, and again, these are in natural units of the richness, we want to see basically a random scatter cloud of data without too much, you know, direction in any one, one way. So if we predict an observed feature to be 70, um, our, the, the amount that we can be wrong is ranging from, you know, this here. So this looks overall pretty good. I don't have any particular qualms with it. Um, we don't have a lot of observations down here, and so we're not predicting that many observations either. Um, you'll notice, you know, a lot of our observations are up here, less of them are here, and so, you know, there is a small trend, but it's not, it's not too interesting. And so I would consider this, honestly, a pretty good model, um, relative to what you could see, certainly. Um, you'll also notice it's a little bit biased towards the positive end here. So like our range goes from 125, but our bottom end is only negative 75. And I'm not too concerned about that because richness is very naturally constrained between zero and positive integers. So realistically, especially at the lower end, you can only go so negative on a residual before it becomes physically impossible. Now that might suggest that our model is maybe not perfectly suited to this data, but very few data sets are perfectly suited to a model. So we're going to not worry about that too much because it doesn't look terribly systematic. Okay, the next thing we might want to know is are any of these, uh, now that we've decided that the model is maybe trustworthy, now we might consider um, whether or not it's significant. 
So we can look at the p-value, and these are relative to a z-score. So we're making an argument to asymptotic normality here. Um, and we see, you know, as significant as you can, the computer gave up on calculating the number here. So it's at least up to three decimals significant. Oh my goodness, don't need that. And so we see the intercept matters and days relative to nearest um, transplant matter. But something we might also want to know is what about the fecal microbiota transplant, which was also done. So the next thing we might look at is day relative to FMT instead of the marrow transplant procedure. And so all of this is actually exactly the same, so I'm going to use a trick. I'm going to copy the state column. And then for my LME observed features HCT, I'm actually going to just hit the run this job again. So that was this refresh button. And what I'm going to change, I'm going to leave all this the same, but I'm going to change our state column to instead be day relative to FMT. So I still want random intercepts on patient ID. I still want to use observed features with our sample metadata. And I'm going to execute that. So I'll give that a minute to run. I'll go back to the instructions in case you weren't able to use the rerun tool. So we use sample metadata. We use observed features also as metadata, and that's metadata from an artifact. We set our state column to day relative to FMT, and our metric is observed features. Looks like our job finished, so I'm going to copy this name, LME Observed Features FMT, which will help me keep track of how that's different from the HCT, as we have two transplants here. I'm going to edit this just finished artifact, call it LME Observed Features FMT, save that, and let's have a look. So we're going to be interested in basically the same things. Here we see our formula. And you'll notice that there's like this cue around it. And you're going to see that elsewhere in this visualization. What that means is we're interpreting this formula automatically as a single uh, expression here. So if we didn't have the cue, which means quote, we would have a formula that was suggesting, well, observed features depends on day times negative relative times negative 2 times negative FMT. And that's just a really frustrating problem to have. So Chime 2 is automatically quoting this and saying, no, I know that this is in fact just day dash relative dash 2 dash FMT. So you'll see this cue elsewhere. All that means is we're taking that string as a literal uh, unit, and we're not trying to interpret it as math. OK, the rest of this is pretty much the same as before. We have a model here. We see it is significant. Should probably look at the diagnostics first, though. We see essentially the same pattern. This doesn't look concerning. I'm fine with this model. Um, there are certainly worse models out there, and no model is perfect. So we see it's significant. And so now we're kind of left with the question of, well, which of these matters more? Is it day relative to FMT? which is, of course, related to, sorry about that, to our day relative to nearest HCT. And so we're, we're actually in a pickle here. There is no way for us to tell statistically that one is truly better than the other. You could make an argument that perhaps this is the space of model testing, and so we should look at the log likelihoods and compare those. But you're going to notice the log likelihoods are nearly identical. And so any model test between these two is unlikely to authoritatively declare one model superior to the other, and they have the same number of terms. So we can't even make an appeal to that, where a simpler model is maybe preferred. Instead, what we're going to realize is that the FMT is, in fact, correlated with our HCT. And so these are essentially the same measure, almost. Um, they are different but they're essentially the same. And so we can see our coefficients are a little bit different, not by much, but there's a limit to what we can tell between the two. 
So knowing that, we might be interested in really getting back at our main question, which is, did the control group interact differently than our um, treatment group, which received the autofecal microbiota transplant? So to do that, we're going to essentially do the same thing, but this time we are going to add a group column. And so this is going to basically collect um, it's going to create a more complicated formula, which will be easier to describe once we do it. So I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to use my rerun trick again. So going back to Galaxy, I'm going to take this latest one, which was the FMT, and that's fine because that's what we were going to use anyways. I'm going to press rerun, and I am going to set, hold on, I got lost. Okay, I'm going to provide a group. So I'm going to find group columns, I'm going to provide a value, and I'm going to provide auto FMT group. And then that's really the only change, so I'm going to execute that. So what is that group column doing? What it's going to do is it's going to increase the formula where we'd be interested in not only day relative to FMT, but also which group you're in. And then also, whether or not the group matters with respect to day relative to FMT. I see the job has just completed. Um, and I'm going to remember to rename this. So this is going to be LME Observed Features Treatment versus Control. I'm going to copy that. Truly, you don't have to rename it, but it would get confusing after a while, so it is recommended. So I'm going to edit attributes. I'm going to rename that save and now I'm going to look at it on Chime 2 view so now we have a more interesting formula we have as a fixed effect day relative to FMT still but also which group you're in and they're multiplied and in the formula language that means we're interested in both of these individually plus the interaction of them which is actually closer to multiplication um, we see essentially the same thing, but now our model results are a lot more complicated. So we still have an intercept. We have the group, and we're doing it with reference to treatment. So we're asking, did treatment matter? Then we have our day relative to FMT, and then the interaction between day and FMT. And that's known because there's this colon. And so we have now a much more sophisticated model with intercept, treatment, day, and treatment times day. Let's have a look at our projected residuals, because that's always important. Um, these pretty much look the same. There might be some concern that the treatment falls in a n narrow band, but that is also exactly what we're attempting to measure. Um, so we'll just keep that in mind, but it's probably fine. Looking at our model, we see that the intercept still matters, and that's fine, but also uninteresting, right? The average richness is not really a thing that anyone cares about. Whether or not treatment was useful is something we might care about, and we see it isn't significant. It's actually deeply not significant. And so that's maybe a little bit disappointing, but it gets interesting if we keep looking. So day relative to FMT remains significant. We kind of expected that. Its coefficient is now actually quite a bit more steep. Um, and so before, we were looking at a coefficient of around half a richness unit, or half, a, half an ASV, actually, per day. So losing half of a kind of bacteria per day. And now we're losing, um, uh, I'm bad at fractions, 0.8 of a bacteria kind per day. We also see that the interaction of day and treatment seems to matter, and its coefficient is positive. It is also significant. And so what's the interpretation of this? We have an interaction term that's more significant than its base effect. Well, the obvious conclusion is that treatment doesn't matter unless you factor in day. 
And so what we're really saying is that the slopes of these two systems are different. Um, so the slope of a treatment group is losing on average more like 0.3 uh, per day, whereas those without treatment are losing 0.8 per day. And you know that suggests quite strongly that the treatment is having some effect. We can look at the scatter plot here, but I do want to make an important note that this scatter plot, these lines, are just basic linear effects. So this is not parameterized by our model, technically. Um, these are just normal linear regressions. And so the slopes here and the um, standard errors here are actually wrong uh, relative to our model. They are perfectly fine, ordinary least square regressions, but we already had a lot of reasons to not use an ordinary least square because we needed those random effects. So these are just giving you a sense of the situation but they aren't strictly your model up here. This is really what we did. So that's pretty exciting. We've learned that the autofecal microbiota transplant does in fact ameliorate the impact of the bone marrow transplant protocol. And so we are losing richness. We're still losing richness, but we're losing it a lot slower than we had been. And so that's certainly promising. So going back to the tutorial, the next question is, how would you test the above mo models with different diversity indices, such as face phylogenetic diversity? Um, I'm going to pause here and let you all work through that, but I highly recommend using the rerun tool because that is super handy. All right, so if you weren't able to figure it out, the solutions are here. And so let's go through the group significance at least, and I'm going to skip going through the linear mixed effects again. But if we go back to Galaxy, and I'm gonna scroll down, and it's a good thing we renamed these things because now I can find it more easily. Alpha group significance, I'm gonna rerun this. And instead of observed features, I'm going to select Faith PD, and I'll execute that. So there we are. Same deal for the uh, more complicated model. We could rerun this, but because we're combining metadata in this one, it looks a little bit different. Instead of saying our metadata is from the artifact of observed features, we're going to say it's, oops, I cannot type, Faith PD. And that's pretty much all we would have to do, and then we could rerun that as well. And I am curious, so I'm going to have a look at it in a moment. I should be done any moment now. An error occurred. Oh, that's interesting. View details. Okay, here's what I did wrong. This plugin encountered an error. Metric must be valid metadata or feature table column. Over in metric, and this is actually kind of hard, this should have been faith PD. Because what's happening is this plugin is basically looking through the metadata, and we've combined those. And so the column name is no longer observed features, it's faith PD. So if I execute that, this should work. 
Now, if I had followed the cheat sheet over here, it would have said, hey, set metric to faith PD, but it seems a little unfair to make you guys do a challenge that I haven't tried myself. And so, you know, sometimes the computer does what you said instead of what you wanted. All right, so let's have a look, because this is exciting. And so here we have basically the same situation, but we're looking at Faith PD instead. And so we see treatment becomes even more meaningless in this case, but the interaction is still significant. We see our coefficients are quite a bit different now. And that's, that's pretty interesting actually, because before we were losing around half of, a, on average, around half of a, an ASV per day or feature per day. And now it takes 10 times as long for the same effect. So this suggests that while individuals are dropping out, um, we're not losing entire clades necessarily or entire phylogenetic groups. There's still enough phylogenetic diversity to see this at a different scale. Actually, calibrating this by scale makes it a little bit clearer too because our magnitude's about a tenth, so the coefficients are actually about the same. All right, well, that's cool. Um, so to, to clarify, our, our axis goes from 0 to 17. Before, we were going from 0 to almost 200. So we've got a tenth of the space to work with. So it's not surprising that our coefficients are similarly about a tenth as large. Um, Nonetheless, it does seem a little bit less extreme. So there might be something more to look into there. All right, so that concludes our alpha diversity section. Um, hope that was helpful.